Hi, Cross and Crown. Adam here, and I'm excited to be able to preach God's Word, share with you today, and share some, uh, some hard-fought and hard-won leadership lessons today with you. We are continuing on as we're looking. Last week, we looked at the mission that God has in front of us, and today, and actually for the next few weeks, we're going to continue taking a look at that mission and what He has, and, and particularly today, what does it look like to pass the baton in leadership? We're going to read out of the book of Joshua this uh, for our time right now. And so I would ask that if you have a Bible, turn to Joshua 1, and I will read for us the first nine verses. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the lessons that you teach us, the ways that you reveal yourself and your character to us. Uh, God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would lead us in this time. That it would be a time of reflection. It would be a time of uh, turning to you. And, and Lord, would you just take this time and bring glory to your name? Would you speak to us in a way that uh, is helpful and, and puts us back on missions for some of us, gets us into the game? God, I ask that you would, uh, by your Holy Spirit, just use me, lead me in this time. We thank you that you are with us and that we can, with boldness and with courage, speak of your truth. It's in Jesus' good name that we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know if you know this, but there are some really, quite frankly, discouraging statistics on the state of the church right now. I mean, we're looking at a really difficult time coming out of the last 15 months. And, and for a lot of leaders within the church and ministries are looking forward, like, what does this mean for us? And how do we even assess and evaluate this? But the hard part about it is a lot of the statistics that came out came out right before COVID. In fact, March 2020 was when a very large uh, uh, set of data came out about the church. And then COVID hit. And here we are. But listen to this. Some of you may have heard this. This actually just came out this year. For the very first time in America's history, a country that was built on the ideals of, of Christian liberty, of Christian freedoms, of identity founded in our maker and our creator, those very freedoms that we would have for the very first time in our history as a country, less than half of the people in the country identify as Christians. In fact, the number is 47% that say they even belong to a church or attend a local church. Think about that for a second. First time ever. Well, if we start to look at some other metrics like weekly attendance, which most are saying between one and a half or two times for every four or five is about when average person would go when they would attend church. Ten years ago, that number was about half of those that would say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian. That number in 2019 was down to 29%. That's a 40% drop in about a decade. It means that people aren't coming to church. Uh, and that was pre-COVID. And uh, other statistics say of those that were attending church before COVID, now about half of them are considering whether or not they'll return. So the numbers are even more dire than we would think. For those that would profess to be Christians, and when we're looking at this, it's people that are actively reading their Bible. They're actively engaged in a church. They're leading, they're serving, they're giving, they're part of a community, they're invested in ministries. The percentage actually goes down even lower. It's about 25% of America would proclaim Christ as their Savior, would be a part of a local church. 
that number has dropped to almost half of what it was 20 years ago at the turn of the century. As I was looking through some of those statistics and thinking through what is the state of the church right now and trying to apply that to us, like cross and crown, what does that look like for us? I was thinking through what are some of the undergirding currents? What are some of the things that are happening below the surface that speak to some of this? And I ran across an author who is an observer of culture and, and particularly looking at the, the effects of religion on a culture. And his, his perspective was when a culture loses its religious undergirding, when it loses its, its moral values and it loses its uh, rules and regulations for life, it, basically the guardrails are taken off, then a society begins to wither, it begins to collapse in on itself. You'd think that this was something that was written in the last 12 months, but it was actually written in 1951. The analogy that he uses is actually that of a flower that when you find it, it's beautiful, it's fragrant, and then you clip it so that you can take it with you and you can put it on your counter in a vase of water, that over time, because it is severed from the source of vitality, it withers and dies. Here's the quote. Cut flowers retain, retain their original beauty and fragrance, but that's only so long as they retain the vitality that they have drawn from their now severed roots. After that is exhausted, the flower withers and dies. It's one thing to take a look at this from a cultural standpoint, but I, don't think it's, I also think it's helpful for us to evaluate and look at the church. What does this mean for the church? Is the church currently, is Christianity in America a cut flower? It sure looks good. It sure smells good. It's on display on your countertop in a vase, but it has a shelf life. Are we cut flowers? Are we firmly rooted in faith or have we severed the tie to the thing that brings us vitality? The question is, are we faithful followers devoted to Jesus or are we just showing up for church? I think it's a necessary thing for us to be able to take a look at today. And in doing so, I think one of the things that we're going to find that the key is, and we're going to learn this from some lessons in scripture, the key is being able to raise up the next generation of leaders within the church. In order to be able to see this, I want to turn to Joshua. It's a book of the Bible. It's named after Joshua, who's a leader that was appointed by God to help lead Israel out of the wilderness. So Moses led them out of slavery. It was God that led them. But Moses was appointed to lead them out of slavery, out of the hands, the oppressive hands of Egypt, through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And for 40 years, they were there. And they were to cross over the Jordan River into a land that God had promised them. And it would be... Joshua, that God would appoint to lead Israel through, through the river and into that place and into seizing the inheritance of the land that God had set apart for them. So that's the place of where we are in Joshua. Now, Joshua, for all accounts, was, uh, was a strong leader in many ways. He was faithful. He led Israel through the conquest of the land because there were people that were occupying that, that God would help remove, and he would lean into and trust the Lord in many of the instances, and God would have his hand upon them and provide success for them. We actually read in, in Joshua 1 where we picked up that God is giving him a commission. He's giving him an appointment to go and lead this nation, and he says, I'll be with you. And he encourages them, be bold, be strong, be courageous. But he also says, trust, trust in this law that I've given you. Trust in this, uh, these commandments that I've given you. Trust in the ways in which I want to reveal myself to you so that we can have a relationship in this. You know, it's interesting because we take a look at the beginning of, most, of, of Joshua's life and his appointment, but we also can take a look at the end of it where we have bookends in essence for his life. So if you turn with me to chapter 23 of the book of Joshua, we can start to see a bit of some of the refrain that's happening here. We pick up in chapter 23, verse 3. And, and Joshua has summoned together all the leaders of Israel. And he basically is at the end of his life and he's giving a charge to what's next. Like, just remember that God has done all this work. He's brought us through. He's given us into a land of inheritance. He has been faithful. So now, what's the charge in front of us? He says, I, I'm old and now well advanced in years. And in verse 3, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations and is for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. See, don't forget it is God who has done this. 
that he has led us into this place and he has fought for you. He has been with us. And he says that he'll push back the enemies that are there in the land and he shall, you shall possess this land just as the Lord God had promised you. The promises are being fulfilled in this. And in verse six, we read, therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left. This is the same language that was read in the very first commissioning where God gave him instructions. And here you see the faithfulness of Joshua. He's taking the things that God gave him as instructions of how to lead. And he's applying them now, exhorting Israel, exhorting the leaders that they would also continue in this way, that they would uh, be strong, they would be courageous, they would trust God, they would believe his promise to be true, they would know that God is present with them, and it says that we're going to follow the law of Moses, that we're going to follow these commandments that God has given to us. He says, so don't turn to the right or to the left, and it's so that you wouldn't mix in with these nations, because what God was concerned about is that they would dilute their faith, that their devotion wouldn't be to him alone. It would be to these foreign gods. And, and they, there would be this mixing. And, and, and basically, there would be this defilement that would happen of God's people. And he wanted to set them apart. He wanted them to be holy. He wanted them to reflect his glory and his character. So we have these bookends then, where God has given Joshua commands. And almost verbatim then, at the end of this conquest, as they're establishing, as they're walking into these promises, Joshua is relaying these same commands to the leaders of Israel. You see, then he has this place where he stands up in front of them and he says, I recognize that we need to be able to turn away from some of these things, that we need to be able to turn towards the Lord. It means that we're going to have to repent. Remember, we've talked about this. It is a full turning away from the things that are not of God and then a turning to the things that are of God. And so we read in chapter 24, verse 14, where, jo where, where Joshua is imploring the nation to turn to God. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord. Don't fear their things. Fear the Lord. And serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. You see here how we can have some of that cut flower language that relates to this. He's like, I don't want you to just make it look like you're putting on a show. I don't want you to just show up and pretend that you're part of this thing that's happening, part of our services, part of church, you're part of the family. I don't want you to pretend in this. Would you lead and worship and serve in sincerity and faithfulness? He says, put away the gods of your fathers that you served back beyond the river or the, the gods that you would serve of this land. He says, verse 15, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve you got to make a decision because when you have two gods or two idols at war, there is no peace. He's saying, choose at this point. Would you walk away from the things that are trying to create an undercurrent? They're trying to create confusion. They're trying to dismantle things. Even think of it today, the things of culture, the things of this world that would draw you away from, that would entice you or would simply just occupy you, that would be things not of God, that where your devotion would be split. Asha is saying, choose. You got to make a choice. In the end of this passage, he says, but for me and my house, here's what we're going to do. We will serve the Lord. It's a definitive and declarative proclamation of who Jesus is. You see, he's calling the people together to a faithfulness. I know this is a popular verse. I mean, some of you might even have it on your wall framed with some reclaimed lubber. It's a nice script. You picked it up at Hobby Lobby. Joanna Gaines would be proud, right? But it's more than that. It is a declaration of your devotion. It's not simply a reminder. So Joshua was faithful. He and his family were faithful. But then we come to the end of his life and the, the tide begins to turn. We read in verse 31, this is after Joshua died. He was 110 years old, and we pick up in verse 31, and Israel served the Lord all of the days of Joshua. He was an effective leader while he was there. They served the Lord. They made that choice. They were devoted to the Lord, and they did it for all of the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. They remembered. They could see it. They worshiped God. They were devoted to him. 
Well, interestingly enough, if you just turn the page, you get to the next book, which is the book of Judges. And there's a couple of different sections in here that talk about the death of Joshua. And if you go to chapter 2, verse 6, we actually pick up again, and it's a, re, a bit of a retelling of the story when Joshua's brought all of Israel together and all the leaders, and he's giving them that, that declaration, like, you need to choose in this. And we pick up in verse 6, when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land, fulfilling the promise that God had given them. I will be your God, you will be my people, I will place you in a land as an inheritance that I will give to you. In verse 7, and the people served the Lord all of the days of Joshua and all of the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had been with him all the great work of the Lord, and they'd seen it, what he had done for Israel. But then we go to verse 10, and it says, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. That is a, a verse that I think has the ability to haunt us. There arose another generation that didn't know the Lord. I think it's a, a potential implication of what a cut flower church or cut flower culture would look like. That when you're not tied to the source of vitality, when you're not given the nutrients needed to sustain life, when you don't abide in the one who gives power, then you wither. It may look good for a while and it would wither away. I think we have to ask the question then, was Joshua a good leader? I mean, it appears so because people, while he was alive and the people he had direct touch and influence over, they continued to worship the Lord as they walked with him. But a mark of a true godly leader, I think, in this way would be, who are those that are following after him? Because if you know the story of Judges, it just goes from bad to worse. It says that people began to do evil they began to do the thing that they thought was good in their own eyes. They rejected the Lord. And it's just a downward spiral. I think we have to ask the question then, well, what went wrong? You see, true impartation of faith, being able to have faith and then to share that with another in a way where it takes effect, it's more than just living a godly life. It's more than just careful instructions. It's more than just giving powerful exhortations. You see, it's rooted in faith, and it's rooted in the faith in the one that provides that life and that vitality. It is faith in Jesus Christ. One of the ways one author I read this week was trying to convey this is he says, our job is to cultivate convictions in others. We don't try and scare them into that. We don't try and condemn them into it. We want to cultivate conviction, because out of conviction, then they will begin to operate a life of faith. And one of the ways that we can do this is that we are to teach people how to observe and obey that which God would reveal to them, the laws and the regulations and the guidelines that he would give. This is simply another way of saying is to know and do the word of the Lord. Do you recognize the great commission language here? The language where God would say, teach them, go and make disciples, teach them to observe or to obey all that I have commanded them. And you hear this language of teaching and obeying, and really what he's saying is it's the same where Joshua would say the law of Moses. It's the same as the Ten Commandments. And we talked about this recently. What are those Ten Commandments? They're a way in which when God brought Israel out into the desert for 40 years, the purpose of that time was so that he could reveal his character, his glory to them. And those laws and those regulations, what they did is they provided guardrails for them so that they could understand the character, the love, the mercy, the patience, the grace of God and fulfilling that promise and that vow that he would be with them. And he was with them and he carried them through that process. We even read in, in earlier in, in Joshua, we read that, that all of the promises that God would give, we recognize that all of those came true. They were given the inheritance of the land. He was with them. Well, what's behind the Great Commission? If we're borrowing from this language, we say, teach the disciples to obey. That's the Ten Commandments. It's that they would know what God is like, simply. But then the Great Commission goes on and would say, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what is baptizing? It is simply making a declaration based on faith that it is no longer you who lives, it is Christ who lives. Or one author would say it this way, you turn from all that you are and you embrace all that he is. 
It's gospel language. It's great commission language. When I say gospel, let me just take a moment and explain what that is. The gospel is the good news. It is the good news that there is a creator God who loves you and wants a relationship with you. And he will draw you near to him. And he will save you. And what is salvation? It is that your sins, and all of us are culpable of this. We're all guilty of sins, ways that miss the mark of what God would have for us. We've turned to the right or to the left. But in all of those ways, God would save us. He would draw us near. He would send his son, Jesus Christ, to go and pay the penalty for those sins, where he would lay down his life. He was executed, crucified, laid in a tomb, dead. And yet three days later, he would rise again by the power of the Holy Spirit. In resurrection power, he would conquer death. And in doing so, when we then put our faith and trust and hope in Jesus, he then gives us his righteousness. It means that we could have a right standing with God. We get to be reconciled with God. It means that we have freedom. It means that we get to turn from all that we are and we get to embrace all that Jesus is. So all of this begs the question then, how do we prevent the next generation from not knowing the Lord? Not knowing who he is and what he has done. I think there's one observation that we can have from Joshua's life is that it wasn't just enough to be a great leader in that moment, but it was how was he raising up other leaders to follow him so that the next generation would not know them. Our charge is for godly women and men to take responsibility to submit to Jesus and then to share that with other people. I think there's two words that we can couple this with. One would be discipleship being a devoted follower of Jesus and a devoted follower of Jesus to other people as well. But I think we can also take a look at this as leadership. So our charge is to establish leaders for the next season. What can we do to prevent the same fate for the church in Seattle as what we saw following Joshua? Well, I think it's a, it's a call to more. It's a call to be able to train up new leaders. And before we get into some of the very practical applications and the steps that you can take to be a part of that, I want to talk through three dangers, I think. And these are just real simple things for us, things that would prevent us or prevent the potential from us becoming disciple-making disciples. Not just that we would live godly lives, but that we would then impart that, we would cultivate convictions in others. Three things I think that can get in the way. It's fear, it's comfort, and it's complacency. Fear, I think, is one of those things where we are afraid that we will be exposed as hypocrites. We are afraid that we are being called to more and we're not going to live up to that standard. And might I just be real frank with you and just say, yeah, you're right. We do live hypocritical lives. We do fall short of the standards that we would place on ourselves. I think it's a fear of just being found out that we are who we are. But think of those bookends that God gave them. Joshua, be bold, be strong, be courageous. Be careful. Fear the Lord and serve Him. You see, the fear that we would have of the Lord is greater than the fear that we would have of men, greater than the fear that we'd be found out. It's a real simple thing. We, uh, our family every summer goes to uh, a, a conference center down in Oregon. It's really, it's like family camp. And I know I just lost all credibility with some of you by saying that. But our kids every year sing the song and it's pulled from Joshua and it's be bold, be strong for the Lord your God is with you. You don't have to be afraid. And they go like this. They go, be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. It's truth. It is the truth that God would remind Joshua of. God is with you. Comfort is another danger that we can run into. We work hard to build up our life so that it's crisis-free. We try and create buffers financially. We try and remove situations that have risk. And we try and create relationships that are just easy. And we're not called to have a crisis-free life. You, think, you see, faith means that we have a crisis-proof life. That when things start to hit the fan, faith is there to counter the anxiety that might well up within you. That you would trust that God is with you. And this is part of making that declaration, just as Jeremiah or Joshua would say, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That is a declaration of faith that sometimes they need to preach to themselves. Do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. The Lord your God is with you. And in a declaration of faith, you will have a life that can endure much. The last one is complacency. 
There's a story that's told in the middle of this conquest where after Joshua takes the people and they begin, they cross the river and they begin taking the land and there's this group of people that see like we're not going to be able to withstand them. So they, they kind of look disheveled. They've worn out clothes, sandals and wineskins and they come up and they're like, oh, would you, would you help us? Would, could we, would you make a covenant with us? Would you promise not to destroy us or to remove us from the land? And, and they say, oh yeah, we'll make a covenant with you. And the sin that was, ex, uh, that was, performed in that was we find in in Joshua 9 14 that they did not consult the Lord you see what happened in this is that they presumed they got complacent they just simply presumed that God would take care of it he promised this so he's going to make it happen there's an encouragement that Joshua gives to the people when he calls all those elders together and he says cling to the Lord your God cling to him Do not let go of him. Do not suppose his grace. Do not suppose his blessing, but ask, be there, cling to him. Keep that flower connected to the root so it may continue in vitality. Let me get into some real personal applications. I've got kind of a long list here of things that I think are helpful, ways that if you want to be a part of that generation that doesn't have to suffer the same fate, and that can impart and cultivate those convictions in other people, it begins with your own dedication and responsibility to being able to lean into and trust God in these. So here are some ways that we can lead as disciple makers, multipliers, that we can lead as leaders. The first one is just simply that we would look back so that we can look forward. Remember what God has done, his faithfulness in your life. Take note of him, take account. How has God shown himself to be faithful to you over and over again. The second one is simply to serve. As leaders, the biblical model that Jesus gave as a leader would be that as a servant. That he didn't come so that he could be served, but he came so that he could what? Serve. And he did so in the greatest demonstration of servant leaderhood. He laid down his life so that we might receive his life. Servant leadership is one of those things where every great leader is a servant leader. And it's one of those things that can combat selfishness. It is actually the fulfillment of the great commandment. Love the Lord with everything and love other people. And the way that we do that well is we serve. We serve the Lord and we serve other people. A value that we have here at Cross and Crown, and we don't get right all the time, but it's still something in front of us that we aim for is that we would value who you are becoming more than what you produce. That you would know God, that you would follow God, that you would submit God. And that's far more valuable than what it is that you are able to bring to the table. One of the ways that you get to experience that provision in your life is through serving and serving others. Number three, that we would give generously. Generosity is a tangible demonstration of the conviction that your resources ought not terminate on yourself. You see, God gave generously, and he calls us to do the same. And this isn't just money. So I'm, not, I'm not calling for your money. What I'm asking you to do is have a, a mindset of hospitality. Have a mindset of generosity. Don't try and hoard and move into a season of self-preservation and protection. Instead, understand that God wants to give good gifts. And you know what? When you operate out of generosity, of your time and your talents, of your money, you know what happens? There's a lot of joy that you get in return of that. That cultivates conviction in those around you. Number four, get trained and equipped. Ephesians 4, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, says that he gave, Jesus gave to the church, apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers, to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To help train and equip people in the church to be a part of the effective work of the church, to fulfill that mandate to go and make disciples. The end result of that, when that's done well, when, when those are willing to submit to those teachers and those teachers are able to lovingly serve them and teach them and guide them and shepherd them, that the body begins to mature, the church matures together, and it says that it builds itself up in love. Again, fulfilling that commandment to love God and to love others. Every third Monday of the month, we have what's called an equip night. I would encourage you to show up. It's here at the church, and it's a simple way for us to be able to give you some tools that are necessary to get trained and equipped as a a follower and as a servant leader. 
so that you might be able to help cultivate those convictions in others. Number five, lead. It might be scary. Maybe God's put this on your heart for some time. I pray that today you've just run out of excuses to not do it. Talk to your community group leader if you're in one. If you're not, get in one. Talk to one of the service leads. Talk to anybody to be able to say, how can I step in? How can I lead? And it's fearful because you may not be well-equipped, but we'll help you come along. We'll help serve you. Would, you. would you talk to your community group leader and say, how can I help ease your burden? How can I help lead this? How can I help care for other people? How can I just simply care just to give a rip about it and be able to step in and help shoulder some of that burden for you? Some areas that you can step in right away and do this is in your community group and in your kids' ministry. Number six, on the job. Well, there's a couple other ways to say this. OTJ is how I refer to it, but really it's failure. Some of the greatest leadership lessons that are learned are hard learned, and they're learned through failure. Don't let the certainty of failure be the thing that prevents the possibility of success. Be willing to get in, be willing to fail, be willing to let that be an investment in you as a leader so that you can then invest in others, having learned through those failures. Number seven, start. You can't get anywhere, you can't be well equipped, you can't grow if you don't start. So some of you, that might just be what you need to do today is take one step forward. Number eight, give away leadership. I had a pastor that was a, a mentor to me and a dear friend, and he, uh, as I, I started in vocational ministry, he would ask me to lead. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's when you're, when you're leaving, right? When you're out of town. He's like, no, no, no. It is far more important for you to lead in my presence than my absence because then we get to do this together. It's a way that he cultivated a conviction in me of a desire to lead and a desire to give away ministry. Number nine, pray. We read in Luke 10, 2, that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Would you pray for more people to step in, to serve, to lead, to give? Would you pray for more people to become equipped? If you are, if you are there and you are serving, thank you. Pray that more would come alongside. But I'm going to invite you, if you're not serving, if you're not engaged, if you're still on the sidelines, I'm going to invite you to pray that very dangerous prayer that God would bring more laborers to the field to help the harvest. Because what I've seen time and time again is that he'll put that on you to pray for that and then give you an opportunity to help meet and answer that prayer. So would you consider it? Lastly, I want to end with a story. A couple of years ago, there was a group of us that got together, a group of pastors in Seattle that got together. And, and initially, it was just to be able to pray and encourage one another. And, and as we were doing this, we, we began to see uh, this deep need for more leaders to be raised. And, and we've, we came together, and, and there was this, this conviction that we had of churches are siloed, right? They're competitive. They're siloed. They're all doing their own thing. And, and the city is worse off for that. And we began to dream and just say, what if it were different? One of the pastors, who's going to be a guest preacher with us here soon, said one day he was up at his church and he was looking up in the balcony and there was a group of 10-year-old boys up against the rail on the balcony. And he had this thought. He said, how do we help make them be the future leaders of the church? You see, the, the area that we are in, in Seattle, it's, it's dire. There's, there's not great Christian colleges to be able to lead biblically faithful followers of Jesus that can become leaders in the church. There's not a seminary here in the city. There's, there's nothing here. And we have to ship people out and then import them in in order to develop leaders in the church to have them be well-equipped and well-trained. And so we started thinking, what if there was something that was for us by us? What if we were able to go and invest in those future leaders? And I'm not talking just about pastors or church planters. I'm talking about men and women that want to lead well in, in ministry, that want to lead community groups, that want to help start ministries, that want to be able to have some effect and create great change in our churches, in our city. And we, we had this conviction and we just said, we can't do this well alone. So we made a commitment that we wanted to collaborate. And God has blessed it with this incredible unity that we have and this brotherhood that we have. So we started what's called the Seattle Leadership Institute. I, the name's not that creative. I don't know how much prayer was put over, but the domain was available, and so we ran with it. And what we started was in January, we just said, hey, we've fought some really hard lessons, and we've won, we've won some of these gray hairs that we have through some of our failures. Why don't we just share some of that and impart it to the next generation? 
And so four churches came together and brought 12 women and men together. And we had a cohort for six months where we just got to pour into them. We got to share. We got to cultivate some of these convictions in them. It's really exciting. We're going to tell you more about it in the coming weeks. But we want to make sure that you know about it. And it's one of the ways that you can invest. And if you are interested, check us out. Go to our website. See what it looks like to be invested in and see what it looks like to be well-equipped to go and do that again and again and again as a disciple-making disciple. You see, I don't want us to suffer that same fate that the generation after Joshua faced. I don't want us to be a cut flower church or culture. I want us to be tied in with faith and vibrancy. And I want to see us be able to raise up more leaders for the church for the sake of the kingdom, to the glory of Jesus Christ, and for the joy that we all get by being able to do that together. We pray for us. Jesus, I thank you that first and foremost that you will build your church. Thank you that you have given us these lessons and leadership and you've given us these opportunities to be able to share our faith with others. God, would you combat those barriers of fear and comfort and complacency? God, would you lead us to more? Would you call us to step up into more? Would you give us the strength and the courage and the boldness and the care to take the next step? So Lord, would you be at work in everyone right now? Whatever it is that they can step up to do God, would you allow them to have the faith to trust that you are with them, to do that, to lean in. And this would be so that the body can get built up in love. It would be presented in the full maturity of Christ. It would be for your glory and our joy. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.